Welcome back, guys, to another episode of the JPS podcast. And in today's episode, I'm very honored to have my man, Aaron Brown, from Mynomics on the show. And we talk about program design for females. So Aaron is presenting a lecture for the JPS online mentorship course on this topic. And we thought it'd be a great opportunity to have a discussion about some of his thoughts, insights, and how we can apply the available research, what we do have available to us uh, to programming for our female athletes. Now, I do have to apologize. We had some technical difficulties and the recording only really started to pick up uh, at a high quality after uh, Aaron's introduction uh, as to the common mistakes and misconceptions around program design for females. So there is a small chunk of this episode missing, but all the good stuff was recorded, fortunately. So just to give you guys uh, the heads up, Aaron discussed that women shouldn't train completely different to men and there are some subtle differences but not uh, large sweeping uh, physiological differences that we do need to consider uh, when programming for females and he also talks about how uh, women can also gain muscle just as well as men and they just start from a smaller baseline essentially. So and if you do enjoy this episode, take a photo, tag us on Instagram and spread the good word. Enjoy guys, and I'll speak to you all next time. Women tend to, to are acutely less fatigable. So for example, women tend to be able to do more repetitions of a given intensity than a male would. Um, we don't know exactly why. Some theoretical reasons are around. There's, because women's muscles are smaller, there's less of a hypoxic environment that goes on within the muscle during a set. So there's less fatigue from metabolites, lack of oxygen, lack of nutrient delivery. That's one of the theories I've heard. Um, but it could be it could be elsewhere. Progesterone tends to have quite um, a positive effect on recovery. Um, it, it tends to be quite protective. Um, but I'm, as I'm sure we'll talk about later, like other hormones will come in at different times and the levels of each, the levels of the two main female sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone will change through through what, what people tend to refer as a 28 day cycle. Yeah, for sure. And there's also some implications of the menstrual cycle uh, in the different phases. So uh, would you like to discuss those in a little bit more detail and talk about how that influences those two hormones that you were talking about? <clears throat> Yeah, so you you um, so there's two phases as you said. Oh, there's there's technically like people can call them four phases. Is like the, the the first half, the early stage of one, the, the late stage of one, the early stage of another, then the late stage of another. Um, but to keep it simple, as two, um, the follicular phase, which is the early phase, or past after menstruation up till um, a follicle's released, and then through that we've got the luteal phase through to menstruation, and it just sort of repeats itself, um, and. As we said, the, the hormones will change at different times. During the sort of, the hormones will tend to peak towards the follicular phase, and then they'll slowly crash and crash and crash and be pretty much the lowest levels they're going to be as we get to the luteal phase, which can cause um, a lot of the premenstrual issues that go on with ladies, and, and in some cases it can be really serious. Some of the psychological implications can be really serious, and the presence of the the high high pres oh, sorry the, the the lack of progesterone and equal amounts of estrogen can cause or can potentially cause issues around injury and, and stuff like that yeah for sure i've definitely seen that in practice as well and outside of uh, hormones alone uh you know there are some fiber type differences uh that could be also contributing to uh you know some of the need for higher intensity so do you want to talk about that as well as some of the anatomical differences yeah so the approximately on average women tend to have about a third more um type 1 fibers than men so the slow twitch fibers um that are less forceful but more endurant that can be part so it, it's an unusual thing i'm sure you've seen it yourself women will get what would be their 5 rm do a full set of five and then do it again and again and again so it's like it's like they lack the capacity to really like get to the top of what it, what the, the the body can actually produce it's like the the, the nervous system's working at like 80 percent um compared to men where men can really like again it might be because they're stronger it might be because they're bigger there the, there are multiple considerations and it's not been flushed out but it seems that that women um tend to um yeah tend to not be able to get to those high high levels of force and cause that high high level of fatigue what's interesting though looking at um intensity so 
they're about so when it comes to comparing high lord to low lord and the differences in hypertrophy when we look at it, it it's pretty equivocal with males um a recent i think it was it was gurich i can't gr gic 2018 did a meter on the differences and uh, other fiber type specific adaptations towards it i think two of the studies were in females so we have two i mean there were three one was a terrible one two one was okay and then one was one's a lot newer um so again it's just it's just very lacking in the data so the 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 the, the first one that said was terrible it's in real real old populations the the protocols are just not anything like we would do with with females um set numbers very low um the protocol was was just not appropriate it was more it was they, they termed it a wellness program so it wasn't even built towards trying to maximize hypertrophy and then the schwenker 2012 they, they had three groups two lower intensity or so higher rep lower intensity one higher intensity lower rep group um and the higher intensity group had about three i think it was three or four times the the growth relative to the other groups but the issues were that they manipulated tempo in the 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 low low groups so strangely that, that i cannot tell which was what was causing what they had them perform about i think it was 10 second concentrics compared to just a conventional tri traditional high load set so it, it's one of those where it's tough and then i know menno henselman's posted this one pretty recently and i saw it recently um where females actually did much much better with low loads which probably would make more sense based on the fiber types but again i have questions around uh, type 2 fibers are more hypertrophyable if that's a real word um the, it's easier for it we, we're more likely to produce hypertrophy within those fibers than type 1 we know that so is it a case of having to preferentially do that or do it a lot so we can make the most out of them or is it a case of use what we've got and hypertrophy the type type one fibers more so it, it's it's a tough one it's one of those ones where it will take some time to really flush it out um and and even as i went through things it seems that a lot of the considerations between men and females are logistical in nature um what was interesting i was looking through the stuff and i was thinking maybe i'll change some of my practice based on this like little things like around the intensities maybe they need more of a varied intensity um then i thought to myself i thought I get really good results with females, so it can't be the biggest consideration, if that makes sense. We still program on a like a, a normal basis. We program them as, as anyone else would do. We we take them from a start point and we just manipulate over time. Um, but yeah, but there are some interesting implications, and I think it's definitely something that's needed. I know you had um, Eric Trex, Trexler on recently, who works with Greg, and I know they're interested in a lot of female-specific stuff. So hopefully they'll be coming through. <clears throat> but yeah, and we said about. Um, some anatomical differences so there are sort of two considerations that we don't so um the q angle which is the angle between sort of two points in the set towards the center of the pelvis and then towards the knee um the angle seems to be bigger in females so it will cause a larger relative um valgus moment at the knee which can cause issues at the knee as we know i mean again a lot of it's in sports is it a consideration for weight training we don't know. I've had cases where women do tend to, to get niggly knees if we do lots of lunges, lots of squats, stuff like that. Is it too much volume? It, again, it's just a case of making sure that we're appropriately recovering from a training session, but it's something that we can consider. And then when it comes to <clears throat> women tend to have smaller trunks and the trunk muscles are very, very important when it comes to supporting the spine, supporting a barbell on the back and in the hands. So even though a woman could have relatively similar muscle mass to a man in the lower body the muscles that the prime movers of a movement like a squat or a deadlift the the ability to produce that strength could be massively hampered um compared to a male so it's something to consider when we look at i mean if maybe if we've got a lady in a leg press and they had the same size quads and, and hamstrings as a male they'd probably be pretty similar but then when we look at the squat we have to consider that um, and consider the stability and the strength of the trunk yeah that was a, a really uh, thorough and comprehensive uh, assessment of yes yeah, some of those physiological anatomical differences uh, in terms of how that impacts the acute training variables uh, we can obviously start to see and flesh out uh, you know some of the considerations we need to have when we're looking at volume frequency and intensity um, but I guess do you want to elaborate on some of the recommendations that you've 
uh, you know, established based on your research into the area and the advice of some of uh, the experts that we do follow uh, who are very uh, well versed in this area. Uh, and then, yeah, take it from there. So we'll start with uh, training volume. Uh, what are your go-to recommendations for training volume uh, and setting things up, not only to see progress in the short term, but also the long term? Yeah, I mean, we can sort of state it pretty simply and say that women need to do more than men um, to 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 make more progress because they need more stress to imagine if we're talking about MEV, MRV, the whole window, it's just like it just slides up. So we just have to do a little bit more. But there are some lo logistical considerations there. Um, we both have this men and women have the same amount of time in a day in a week. So maybe we need to employ some strategies that cut the need for total volume, but sort of increase the potency of the stimulus at each sort of session. Um, and then we have to balance that again with the, the potentially a higher risk for injury. People tend to get to get injured more at higher intensities than they do at higher volumes. Um, so that's one consideration. So stuff like, like myo reps, um, cluster sets, uh, rest, all these different things could be really, really useful, especially for muscle groups where that aren't a priority for a female. And that's another thing. Maybe maybe females are more a, a priority phase is more appropriate for females. Maybe they need to specialize at any one time. Is it going to be realistic? Not that they can't recover from it because the recovery cap capabilities allow them to do more. But logistically, are they, are they going to fit in the time to do those things? Are they going to be able to do all the sets that they need to to make to make progress in a in a in an appropriate way? I mean, I can't even say ideal because, like I said, we we don't necessarily know, but in a way that we would deem as, as ideal and we're happy with, do you know what I mean? So, um, and then again, it's one of those things where women tend to gravitate towards a lot more cardio and a lot more um, activity outside of just resistance training. But if you sort of think about it, I know res resistance training hasn't got a huge metabolic cost, but it is still a lot, do you know what I mean? It's still, it's still gonna be something that's gonna affect our total daily energy expenditure. So maybe we have to consider a little bit more of a surplus for a female, especially if they push it into the high, high volumes. And then do we need as much cardio for the female? Can we manipulate training and, and optimize body composition rather than sort of working them down that way? I know it's tough in some cases. Women can be small. They can have very low um, maintenance calories. So we need to sort of push them towards the end. Um, but yeah, so it's something we could consider. Could we increase the training volume and push on muscular gains, especially in early, like people that are a bit more, uh, that are newer, maybe recomposition may be more realistic in, in newer individuals too. So there's lots of considerations, but yeah, <clears throat> the one, the big one that's interesting for me is the manipulation of other variables to sort of try and bring down that total volume or the total time needed to get the same stimulus. So increasing, so going close to failure, maybe using higher intensities, like we say, um, using rest pause, stuff like this. So, so yeah, that, that they're the big considerations when it comes to volume. Fantastic. Now, before we go into the other variables, you touched on something that is really important to not only the effectiveness of the program itself, uh, but females' ability to make progress, uh, not just in strength, but morphological adaptation. So that is building muscle um, and ultimately changing their physique and their body composition. And that was the need to eat above maintenance calories so in a surplus and the potential for a greater surplus given the the higher volume uh, in the training stimulus as well as their the tendency of females typically to uh, perform greater amounts of uh, physical activity across the board which which we know um, diminishes recovery um, resources and is just going to potentially hinder um, you know subsequent training performance and therefore muscle growth so uh, Let's talk about how we would address these types of issues in females because it can be very difficult uh, to break away from the dogma that you need to be performing an hour of cardio a day, you need to be eating 1,500 calories. And that can be one of the biggest uh, limitations for a lot of females um, outside of obviously the time constraints uh, associated with getting in enough volume from a logistical sense. Uh, these kind of psychological uh, you know, implications and these embedded beliefs and value systems that they do have uh, can create a, a huge obstacle for not only a coach but also uh you know the female athlete who's looking to improve and get bigger so how do we address this what is your approach you've worked with quite a lot of females obviously you've had some great success with uh, holly and her training um so so what's the uh go-to for these kind of situations it's a it's a tough one i think <laughs> a lot of the times i mean 
I think I think that is one of the big reasons there is this big misconception around males and females. The difference is in their ability to gain muscle mass is the fact that females waste volume on cardio when they don't need to. Jump they could volume. be doing more resistance training, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I think uh, although this podcast, what what you do, what we do, a lot of the times is is looked at towards optimizing body composition and optimizing muscle mass. Not everybody wants that. So we have to make sure we're considering the individual. Is the person willing to to gain that more that, that much more body fat? Where have they come from? What are they looking to actually achieve? I mean, so sometimes if we're looking at someone like so you're working with a if you're working with a physique competitor, it has to be a real talk conversation. You have to tell them that if 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 they want you to to get them to the be, in the best position possible to win shows, do the best they can, it is something that they're gonna have to give up in the short term for the long term gain. But when it comes to to females that are more recreational, gen, gen pop, I mean, sometimes I find it tough to really push them. Maybe it's something that is a really slow and steady thing, taking them through maintenance phases, showing them they can eat more calories. I know something that you do, you, you start with a higher deficit and then you bring it up, don't you, over time and sort of prove to them that it's not an on and off switch, it's a dimmer. Do you know what I mean? It's a dimmer. It goes like that. There's this range of deficit. You just start here and move up to here. So it, it's... Again, it's not scared of eating more. Like you say, not scared of doing less cardio. They're just they're just variables that manipulate a central theme of energy balance, and that's all we're looking to do. So I think education is really really important. Um, keep keeping in contact with the individual is important. Making sure that they know that that you're being open and honest with them. Do you know what I mean, tell them what to expect from the start. Don't tell them that they're gonna gain all this muscle, not gain any fat, look great, and and then they get to it and think holy shit like uh, they, they don't they don't understand what's going on so if they can see what's coming first it can help a lot but i think a big consideration is what is what is the individual really looking for are they are they looking for maximal growth or are they not if it's maximal growth it's something they have to give up it's a trade-off it's life but if someone's just looking to look a little bit better feel a bit better improve slowly over a period of 10 years maybe we don't need such an aggressive death uh, uh, surplus maybe we could just go to maintenance maybe we could put them in a bit of a surplus and allow them to do a little bit of cardio or, or just some light activity if they enjoy it it's what can we do to get this person to that end point in the best position um in the best time scale so it, it, it's it's very different for different people you're just trying to slowly manipulate the, the variables within what the individual is comfortable with what they believe in and what they want because it it's one of those, unfortunately, caught, like we all have them. Bias is, is 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 something that's really hard to quiet at times. So it's trying to make sure that we are not influencing that individual's decision outside of what they really want. Do you know I mean, we're not telling them to do X if they want to do Y. We're just saying try Y squared or try Y plus this. Do you know what I mean, we need to keep their central central goal, their goals at the, the center point of our mind. Yeah, for sure, man. You hit the nail on the head. There's a lot of really good points there uh, that I just want to flesh apart a little bit more before we uh, get into the other acute training variables. Um, and something that I do with a lot of my clients is just a needs versus wants analysis. Um, because often what my females need is time in a calorie surplus, despite the fact that they don't necessarily want it. Um, so, you know, Doing this kind of analysis can really help you uh, determine where the client's at in terms of what they want um, and what they need. Because if they want it and they need it, then they'll pursue it. Um, but if they just want it and like the idea of it, but they don't uh, need something, then they're potentially going to uh, you know, think about it and it's going to be an option for them that they maybe pursue. Um, but if they don't want it and they need it, then uh, yeah, they're typically going to avoid it. So it's, it's something that you do need to pay attention to. And as you mentioned, I think a more graded approach is necessary as opposed to the traditional bulk cut, uh, you know, very you know, black and white uh, traditional approach to, to dieting. Um, and that goes for most of the changes that we need to make towards uh, the, the typical female uh, mindset around body composition, which is the low calories, the car the the cardio, um, you know, all these sorts of uh, I guess unfounded uh, protocols that they have in the gym and stuff. Um, you do have to slowly transition through from you know one one thing to the next in order of priority. You know, it's like what's going to get the biggest result uh, immediately, and what's going to be the most easiest to change immediately. And then really, you know, assess the variables from there and what you can do to change that. But 
in terms of how you would approach uh, the training program and making adjustments to training, when you have a female who uh, particularly doesn't like lifting weights, for example, or comes from a background where they've performed a lot of you know, cardio, group training, this is something I deal with all the time, and they do have these embedded beliefs that um, you know, cardio and sweating and feeling equals, you know, these, these feelings of being sore and stuff equals results, and then all of a sudden we're telling them, hey, we're gonna perform the same exercises, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, for the next six, six to eight weeks. Um, you know, we don't want you to be sore too much. Uh, we want to lift heavy. How do you go about, uh, you know, addressing those kind of issues? Yeah, that is a really tough one. I think one. I just one thing I want to say on that point before is is one thing that I take a lot of, uh, I take a lot of pride in is is I think that the practitioner's words are very important. What you import, what you focus on, what we focus on as coaches is what the client will focus on. So if every time the person checks in, I, I'm so focused on their weight and the measurements and the lowness of their calories, that's something that they're going to feel is valuable. So we've got to make sure that we we stress the importance of performance. We stress the importance of how they feel. We stress the importance of their habits. I try and focus on the actions rather than just the results. Mm -hmm. I mean, say like yep. you did X, Y, and Z excellent this week. Continue doing that. That's what I start with, and then I just the way. So the measurements are an afterthought. That's that's just a byproduct. The result is is the way that they look, the way that they feel, and and how long they can hold on to that for, or how long they can repeat those processes for. That again, that's something that's really really important. But when you when you're talking about trying to get ladies to transition to lifting weights when they've done a lot of cardio before. Um, it's a really, really tough one. It's not something that I tend to have to deal with a lot, to be totally honest, because the type of people that I that I attract are people that are into training, like they're into following people like Holly and any of my other clients. So it's a tough one. But I think, again, it just has to be, an, I think first off, you have to create buy-in. You have to be honest with them. You have to really show that you care. You have to really show that you're listening to them. And you have to you sort of have to prove that, that, um, that you want what's best for them. And sometimes that means that, you don't start with resistance training. You can't start with that. It's something that you maybe slowly introduce over time. Um, yeah. So and then you slowly explain and understand and educate the individual so they understand a bit more. Because because like you say, if someone's been doing cardio for for 25 years, something that they're emotionally attached to, and you tell them that that stuff's rubbish, it's making them it's it's not improving their body composition, and they need to lift weights. There may be an emotional attachment. They may push you away, and you may lose that client in that moment. So it's, it's, it's making sure that that you show un unconditional care. You really do want the client to to do well. You have to want that. Um, you have to prove it. You have to be there for them. And then I think sometimes it's just a slow, like like with the diet. I think with ladies, deal with a lot lot different psychological issues than men, based on. I mean, not that they're totally different. Men still struggle. I think men just don't report it as much, but females definitely deal with a lot more psychological issues than men um, based on social pressure and stuff like that. Again, it's, it's been going on for a long, long time. So yeah, so that graded approach, being with the, being with them through the whole time, creating buy-in, um, creating confidence and self-efficacy within them. Um, sometimes it's good. It's a tough one to do when you're online. If you're in person, you can really give that person confidence. You know I mean, show them technique. You know I mean, show them a good example. There's lots of things. So so it's different in person and online, but you can definitely do it. But it just takes a little bit more of a a one to one sort of, and it takes actual coaching that individual versus just programming something in and saying this is going to work. Yeah, man, absolutely phenomenal. So I couldn't agree more. And I think that yeah, like you said, it's not that women have issues and men don't. It's just men are dealing with a, a separate type of issue. For example, <coughs> getting them to train with better frequencies as opposed to you know, the bro session for example or always training to failure and um, you know letting ego get in the way of their lifting there's just a different subset of problems that we typically troubleshooting when it comes to um, you know mindset in regards to men versus females but there is carryover and a lot of uh, you know men potentially attach themselves to cardio as well but it's just more common in females just to clarify for listeners who might think that uh, you know we're trying to sort of say that females are the only ones with these uh, sorts of uh, tr troubles and whatnot so that's a really good foundation to then start talking about frequency because we have more volume um, and we need to get women to train with more volume. We spoke about how 
you need to use some time efficient uh, overloading strategies such as Maya reps, cluster sets. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with those, uh, quick Google search and you'll be able to find uh, out what they are and how to do them. Uh, but frequency, so let's talk about uh, frequency. And I guess you, if you want to define frequency, because people understand that it's how often we train, um, but do you want to talk about why this is important for program design uh, when it comes to females? Yeah, so I think depending on the goal, I think we're primarily referring to muscle gain, but depending on the goal, it's like it, it, I usually usually like a, a, a weekly time period. So it's the amount of times you train a muscle group for hypertrophy or a movement pattern for strength at, during the, during a microcycle or a week's period. Um, and then when so this one's a bit of a, it's it's quite an easy one to deal with luckily because there's there's no good data men and women are just mishmashed together and there's 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 not very much well there's nothing I found on females alone that that take into consideration the menstrual cycle menopause all these other things so it's a tough one but it's theoretically it's a pretty obvious one we we sort of when we look at men again I'm not just carrying men up to women but when we look at men when volumes equated muscular gains are the same frequencies as a very small effect so frequency tends to be more of a logistical issue rather than uh, an actual than a practical issue something that sorry something that actually makes a practical difference so all i'm saying so what i mean by that is sorry is, is it just allows us to get more quality volume in over a weekly period whilst not sacrificing in the short term so a good example is someone has 20 sets of, of quadriceps to do you do that in one session, you can do it in two, or you can do it in three. So you either have 20 sets one day, 10 sets another day, or you have approximately about six to seven sets in the other day, other days. It's pretty obvious which is going to be superior. I mean, when we look at the amount of load we're going to be able to lift, our technique, risk for injury, longevity in that as well. Um, so yeah, so it, so again, I think, I don't know if it's Eric Helms, a lot of people sort of refer to it as like um, the holes. I mean, it's just opening and closing our opportunity to add, add in more volume. And for females... It's just something we can take advantage of, so we can use higher volumes. Um, again, there are a few implications. So, the women are, women are smaller, mostly. Women lift lower loads mostly, so they tend to cause and they and they recover better. So they tend to cause less total total stress that affects the system than males do. So a really really strong male may need a long time period between two big overloads whereas a, most females even the bigger females tend to not cause the same level of all, overload and need the same time period to recover from it so we can use so we can use increased frequencies so oftentimes i'll have ladies on four times a week of, of whole body sessions they'll do uh, they'll do a, a, a squat pattern they'll do a hinge pattern they'll do a push or pull some delts and some arms um within each session so it's something we can do. I don't think it's, it's, it's not necessarily again, it's just a logistical consideration that can improve it. And another, another real logistical, just a simple, but logistical one is that, that as the fact that women use lower total loads, they take a lot less time to warm up. A woman's second set on a barbell can be their working set. Whereas a male that squats 250 kilos, you, you, for example, that squats 210, was it the other day? You could, you might need half an hour. You might need 25 minutes. 240. To get Don't cut me 30 kilos short, man. Yeah. <laughs> It was for reps. It was for reps. Oh, yeah. Um, right. <laughs> it might take you 25 minutes to work up to that weight. It takes about, so, yeah, not, usually 30 odd minutes. Yeah, so you might have to do that with every single exercise. That is just going to be two hours of warming up. Do you know what I mean? So it's just a different consideration. So it's something that can be useful to think about. But again, yeah, it's, it's one that maybe needs flushing out. I can't see how it can be much different um, outside of being women just doing a little bit better and higher frequency because they can just squeeze more volume into a week period. Awesome, man. That makes a lot of sense uh, at a very pragmatic level. So uh, on to intensity. We've kind of talked about intensity uh, intermittently and as almost an afterthought when discussing uh, volume and frequency, but it, but it isn't an afterthought because uh, it's inextricably related to uh, volume and frequency because the more volume you do, generally speaking, uh, you know, intensity needs to be very uh, closely monitored and managed because uh, if the stress is too high and the dose is also high, then we can potentially run into uh, issues with overreaching, uh, injury, and all this sort of thing. So, what are the considerations for females in regards to intensity? Uh, in regards to volume, I know that some of your recommendations uh, for rep ranges are between 14 to 24. So, uh, that sort of gives gives rise to uh, you know an intensity or loading zone that's going to be appropriate for that rep range uh so do you want to talk about intensity and uh where things are at in terms of the research 
So the 14 to 24 was like a set recommendation. So I think it was me. Oh, that's just, set. Just been, yeah. So right, you know the right, the right. male that that. The, the general rec recommendation is 10 to 20 sets. Maybe just skew that like two to that's five right. sets. So that, so that was just a random, that was right. a random recommendation. But yeah, no, no. But but it's interesting when it comes to intensity. There, are, as we sort of I sort of alluded to before, there are only like three studies that that, that have looked at this in any sort of detail. Um, the the one that's furthest back back the Schwenker study 2012, where they looked at the the one with the really strange tempos. I couldn't really take much away from it. There wasn't much confidence in that study. It's probably something that needs to be replicated and maybe changed a little bit, made more appropriate. The program wasn't very appropriate. The tempos was very different between conditions. So it's hard to pick out what causes what. There's a 2017 paper, out of, um, and I know Bill Campbell and I think Len Norton were two of the authors um, that were on there that looked at, it was moderate or high um, intensity training. So there was like rep ranges from like 10 to 15 and then the other rep range is like four to eight i think so it's not massively different um and and as a result of that they didn't really see any differences in hypertrophy between the groups that was a really well done study um the protocol was excellent there were collegiate women so they were there, there was probably an interest within training and nutrition um they weren't necessarily trained females but they had an interest in the area and then a, as i said there's a more recent one franco et al 2019 I couldn't actually get hold of this study, so I can't look. I couldn't look exactly at the methods and stuff like that and the results. But the based on the abstract and based on looking at people like like Mena Henselman's, what Mena Henselman says is that the group that did the lower repetition, the the lower loads, so 30 to 35 RMs, had much better hypertrophy from from the protocol. So again, it, it sort of the Schwenker one showed the higher intensity, but it was a strange study. The low one showed, sorry, the um, Franco et al. showed the the higher reps were better. And then the, the Norton and Campbell study showed that there was no difference. So it's a tough one. But I tend to think more than anyone else, women need probably need a variety of, rep, of, of, of intensity zones or intensity loading just to make sure that we're making the most of it. Because we don't really know. Do you know what I mean, it's, it's, it's not too hard to manipulate intensities over time. And I don't think it will cause any negative benefit, uh, any negative effects. So I think it's something that if we're looking to maximize hypertrophy, it's something that we should probably consider as with other things. It's one of those, it's like the, it's like the anabolic window. It's maybe it's not perfect, but, but if it's not going to cause any negative effects, why would we not do it? Do you know I mean, it's just because something's not brilliant or has an amazing result doesn't mean we shouldn't do it and throw it out. So the same thing here, we're not quite sure, but based on that, I would say, let's just go with this, a similar sort of consideration as with males. Let's use a plethora of different repetition ranges over time. Yeah, awesome, man. And I think just an important point on that uh, is that, you know, generally speaking, uh, women, women work hard um, and can train very, very hard. But generally speaking, they struggle to determine, uh, you know, their RPE or, or get close to failure because it, it'll start to hurt or feel difficult uh, and they're not, you know, sometimes aware, and this has definitely been my experience, um, of how many more reps they could have potentially done. Um, you know, you'll see a, a female, say, on a squat, her reps might start slowing down and, and you could look at that and say, hey, that was probably an RPE of eight or nine, but then if you had to perform an AMRAP, she could have probably performed five to six more. Um, so in terms of intensity, um, how do you approach teaching females how to use uh, the RPE or the RIR uh, scales appropriately, given that uh, some of these uh, differences in fiber type and potentially uh, other differences that affect their fatigability within a set um, on accurately using that scale? Because it's a very common uh, measurement of intensity and proximity to failure but I feel that for females sometimes it may not necessarily be used accurately uh, due to some of the reasons that we've spoken about so uh, any <coughs> advice there and what are your thoughts so yeah it, it, so based on the way that I like to program or that I program for a lot of my clients we use like the like a block approach where we do an accumulation and a deload um, and I always sort of say to people that at first, you're not going to be perfect at it. It's okay as long as you feel like you're working hard. And and again, RPE, what is it? It's a subjective rating of effort. I think I think based on the individuals, again, as long as a person's confident and they're not like really scared. But based on the person's in, person's individual experience, it sort of scales. So if you say to a woman that's barely done anything, you need to do seven out of ten in terms of effort, even if that's like four or five reps and fail. 
it's probably appropriate for that person based on their need to maintain technique, based on the need for stress. Um, and then they just get better at it over time. And I tend, I tend to get ladies to look more at historical data. And I sort of just think of it as like a ladder. You're just using – I tend to not be too bothered about them tracking, tracking reps in reserve as weeks go by. So it's more how they start a block is really, really important with it. So if they start too hard – they tend to shit out at week three or, or week two, whereas if they start just enough, and I just say you just need to progress. This just needs to get a little bit harder each week. You need to be pushing a little bit harder, and you need to feel like it's a little bit harder. So that can be just perceptual. So if someone's in a fat loss phase, it's going to be tiny little. It's going to be it's going to be small amounts of progress. They're not going to be able to put ten percent on the bar each week. Um, but in a masculine phase, they might they, again the nutritional phase will sort of align with it. Fat loss phase, you're going to feel a bit more tired. You're not going to feel as motivated to push yourself, and that probably correctly aligns with it as long as you are making some sort of effort and the type of per- the, the individual is the type of person to want to get the most out of the training then they'll do it uh, again i think even the same with males women tend to not need to be held back in a lot of cases it, it, it's small women that are uncommon or have not done it very much but as soon as women get to, to training women are animals i mean they're they're, they're beasts it's crazy um but yeah, so it's, I, I try to use a lot of historical data and, and, and it's similar with anyone. I know I, there's def, I definitely have an experience with that slowing down. Like Holly's done some unwraps and I've been like, that was like zero. That was like minus five reps in reserve, but she just just carried on going on. It's crazy. But that's that's based on their own experience. So they'll know that. It's just it's something that you have to build up over time. It's not something that you can just sort of, I think I think we just need to separate it from the male. As soon as the rep slows down, that's four in reserve. I think it's just something that we have to be aware of the difference. So you have to just tell them, ladies tend to slow down earlier than males, but can continue on further. It's not always the case. It, it is sometimes, but it's just making them aware of that so they can be a bit more cognizant when it comes to sets. And then just just promoting progression week by week, whether uh, as much as they can do within the scope of their program. Yeah, man, I really like that. I think too many people get tied up on numbers uh, in, when using the RPE scale. Um, obviously, that's what it's intended for. But provided you, you do find an appropriate starting point to have a stimulus that is effective uh, and then it's getting harder and harder and it feels harder and harder, that's a really uh, useful perspective to have, I think. So, awesome, man. Um, now guys that is all we have time for today Aaron thank you so much for coming on man I really appreciate it Um, I'm sure listeners got a lot out of this one if you want to follow Aaron and I recommend you do check him out Myonomics I only knew you as Myonomics for so long Um, on Instagram where else can people find you Aaron um, so yeah, we've got a website as well, www.myonomics.com. Someone stole myonomics.com, so we've got myo-nomics.com. There's a blog on there. We've got some products. We've got so soon coming. We've got like a little, like a four-week free coaching group co- coaching program, a physique on ramp. So there's plenty of stuff to look at on there. But yeah, it, mainly social media and Instagram. But there's plenty of stuff on the website too. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for your time. Guys, make sure you check out Aaron and all of his work, and we'll hopefully get him back on soon. And I'll speak to you all next time. Thanks for listening.